Um, it is a real distinct honor for me to uh, help lead this, I think, going to be a very dynamic discussion about uh, this region's place in the global economy. Um, and I do want to remind everyone, we are going to have time for audience uh, engagement, time for Q&A at the end of this discussion. So start to think about the questions you would like to ask this panel. So first, I, well, let me introduce uh, our guests. And I know that their bios are in your packet. So let me just introduce them real quickly. Um, obviously, we've already heard from the great mayor of the Mile High City, the mayor Hancock, who's on my left. Next to him is the mayor. <laughs> Uh, and the mayor who has been mayor of that city for 22 years, but I know as the mayor, he will be mayor for life. But he's not only a great friend and colleague, friend to the Brookings Metropolitan Program, but he also is the chairman of the Global Cities Initiative um, at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, sitting to his left is Kelly Bro, president and CEO of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And then on the far left is Greg Clark. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow um, at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. And uh, we all consider him the guru, if you will, of international cities. And you will hear that from him uh, as part of this panel. But one of the most interesting titles, if you see in his bio, is because of all the work he does in cities around the, around the globe, he is, quote, an international mentor and advocate <laughs> for cities and metros, which I'm sure is not an easy task. So what we're going to do on this panel is really explore the level of globalness uh, in this global city and what additional steps this region can take to really increase its presence and strength on the global stage as the mayor uh, set off this morning. And as Bruce suggested, um, to inform this discussion, we are going to kind of talk through the paper that Brookings and J.P. Morgan Chase released this morning called The Ten Traits of Globally Fluent Metropolitan Areas. And that paper, by the way, is in your packet uh, if you haven't seen it already. Now, I think of these traits as really just simply good regional economic development practices, but all of it run through the global lens. That is the reality of today. But I really should talk about, turn to the co-author of this paper, Greg Clark, uh, about what does it actually mean to be globally fluent. So uh, tell us in your own words, what does the phrase global fluency mean? Well, thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the invitation to be here. Um, as you can hear, uh, my accent is from the, the eastern seaboard, but it's the, <laughs> the eastern seaboard of Europe, not the eastern seaboard uh, of the yeah. USA. Um, this idea was actually coined by Mayor Daly, and it was his inspiration that gave it to us. But I think there are three ideas at the heart of it. Um, the first one is this, that in this new global economy that Bruce has so brilliantly described, there is more than one way to become a global city. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we thought you had to be a financial center. 100 years ago, you had to be a national capital. 200 years ago, you had to be a center of military might or empire. These days, you can be a global city in many different ways as long as you learn the language. The second idea in this is that globalization, in a sense, is an invitation to learn that language. And every city has to learn it in their own way. There's more than one dialect, if you like. But becoming more fluent in a language makes you uh, more self-confident. It makes you more able to operate on your own behalf. It makes you more self-determining. And if a metro learns the language of globalization, it then infuses everything else they're doing. The third idea in this is that actually if you look across the world and you look at the, the most recent wave of successful engagement with the global economy, and Denver is in there as one of these 42 case studies, what you discover is some really useful practical lessons, not just about how to go global, but how to manage the implications of globalization within a metro. So that's really what we mean by global fluency. Bruce has talked about some of the traits, and they're, they're up here for us. Um, I will talk, I think, a little bit later about some more of them, but specialization with global reach is obviously very important. You have to be in the value chains that matter and have the right position. International connectivity, when I heard Mayor Hancock talk about the, the direct flights to Tokyo, that's obviously part of Denver becoming 
more globally fluent. And then compelling global identity, I think, is a, a very interesting point, which we may come back to. So that's so the idea. Let me ask you one follow-up question, which is given all your travels, why now? Why is it so important to introduce this concept of global fluency? Well, as you know, Amy, I'm on a journey that goes Brisbane, Oslo, Denver, Frankfurt, <laughs> and then Barcelona next week. So I'm in the middle of the most uh, horrendous tour. Uh, the reason for now is the character of the Great Recession. Yeah. The character of the Great Recession is not just a cyclical change in the economy. It's a structural change. And that structural change means that the centers of growth in world markets are now outside Europe, and they're outside North America. And therefore, it's not possible to conceive of a successful future just based on the trading partners that we've historically had. We have to pursue new markets, not just for manufactured goods and innovation, but for international students and tourists and visitors, for capital flows. If we don't do it now, then the metros in Europe and North America will end up being the second division, not the first division. Great, that's very helpful. Mayor Daly, um, you coined this phrase, forced us to really think about putting a definition behind it. But you coined global fluency. Tell us how Chicago is a globally fluent metro area. Well, historically, uh, uh, Chicago is a city of immigrants, even today. So we always welcome immigrants. And transportation was the key water, and it went to a rail, of course, and then it went to truck and air. And so it was always a, a transportation hub. At the same time, we always view the world as an asset, not as a liability. And so whether it's the business community, whether it's you know, higher universities, uh, whether it's the hospitals, we connected with the world continually. But America has come into a dilemma where there's two instances that happened in, in this century. Uh, first of all, we should study the last century and find out what was right what was wrong. This century, 9-11 really changed America's view of the world. We view them more as a liability than an asset. And second, the recession has hurt us at home. And so what has mayors have done, uh, and governors, they see the world as an asset in the business community. And so yesterday in a discussion, someone talked about national security. It's amazing. It always comes up in discussions now. When you talk about Washington, you don't talk about the executive branch. You talk about national security. Everything is national security. And America is caught in that dilemma. And, and so Chicago has always viewed the world as an asset That's because great. it was followed by the world. So let me take one of these traits, number four, which is about adapta adaptation. And Chicago, as you said, historically has always been a global city. It's been well, it's, it's got a legacy and an orientation, a location that made it so. But you can't rest on your laurels. You have to right. keep adapting to the changing global environment and keep putting in place strategies and, and so forth. So what did you do as mayor to ensure that Chicago stayed a global city? Well, we had forums around the world. We were first ever invite uh, uh, Arab mayors from North Africa, Middle East, to the United States first time. And they came, about 85 to 100 came. And we invited them. We invited uh, mayors from South America, all through China, Southeast Asia, Europe, and Africa. So we continue to have these forums at various universities. At the same time, the business community has stepped up, inviting ambassadors uh, and your council generals, uh, having ambassadors come in from Washington, from the rest of the world, and then inviting various dignitaries to give presentations to, to uh, World Business Chicago in Council of Foreign Affairs and the universities. At the same time, languages. I think our, our schools, elementary school, we decided to start teaching Arabic, Russian, and Chinese. And they also they should be uh, teaching uh, Portuguese, Brazilian. Why is that? Because you want them to look at the world differently than we looked at it in the last century. The world has opportunities here and abroad. You can create jobs here, help a country, and help the world. And I think that is our greatest asset, what is happening in our universities, what's happening in our education. But at the same time, K through 12 is struggling in all America, K through 12, uh, especially in a very diverse society. And from my viewpoint, it is the strategy of the non-for-profits, government, and business working together. I think it's really helpful that you remind us that one of the most important things is to arm our younger generation with the traits and the skills to, to act globally, which is number five over there. But we're going to come back to that. Um, Mayor Hancock, you, you're really articulate and really passionate about the city as a global city. 
Um, you've been traveling a lot around the globe. Mm -hmm. Tell us, given what you've observed about what's happening, these dynamics, what I'm sure what Greg observes, mm -hmm. the actions taken by other cities, is what gives you promise and optimism that Denver has what it takes to really be competitive on a global stage? I think first, Amy, we had to answer the question of why we would think that we could be global or want to pursue yeah. more globalization as a city. I think Mr. Clark hit the nail right on the hand when he talked about this global recession that we went through creates the necessity for all of us to begin to break through our, our national yeah. borders and realize we've got to get deeper and we've got to get broader with regards to our economic interests. So that's, I think, the first why is to get deeper and create greater business opportunities for those businesses that are located here. Secondly, Denver has been traditionally a driver in the innovation uh, industries, quite frankly. I mean, technology is a global industry. Um, you know, bioscience is a global industry. Energy and sustainability are global industries. And, it's, you know, leisure and travel, global industries. We have been at the hub or the hub of those industries for quite some time. And we're getting better and broader and stronger in each of them. And so with the, the increasing attraction to Denver because of those industries, and our real commitment to embrace those industries and to take them across the waters and to really exploit them as opportunities for not only business to come to us, but for us to create opportunities for our local businesses, locally based businesses, I think it creates the opportunity for it. And then finally is the connectivity. We are very committed. You don't have the fifth busiest airport in the country, 13th in the world as a non-coastal city and not have the interest of the rest of the world look at you and say, what is driving that? Mm -hmm. And as we go around the world, whether it's in Africa, the African continent or the Asian continent or the European continent and South America, there's a great deal of interest because of our location, because of our quality of life, and again, because of our emerging innovation industries that we've embraced and that we're willing to take abroad. You've talked a lot about, we all applaud the success of Tokyo Direct Line. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've talked about Air City. Give us a sense of what else is on your docket. What are the other priorities you have to continue to strengthen that uh, Denver presence and stage? Well, I think Bruce mentioned it. We have to continue to remain committed to growing, locally grown, nurtured, educated young people who are ready, prepared to compete in the 21st century around the world. And, and that means that we have to be committed on a regional basis, that every one of our children, no matter where they live in this region, will be educated, will have access to quality programming, will have opportunities to learn different languages, will get a chance to do exchanges. I'm going to tell you, in the nonstop flight, and I mentioned it before, I'm happy to take business leaders across the waters. We're excited about that. But I was so proud of the fact we took nine students from Denver to, to Tokyo, Japan, and then ultimately to Takayama to explore and to learn and to see the change in those young people. It's opened their worlds. It happened to me as a kid. And so that, those are very important, cultural exchanges, but preparing the workforce, the today and future workforce to compete globally has to be our number one priority. Otherwise, this is all for naught. But we will do it. We are doing it. We just got to make sure it's our kids who live here in Colorado who are being raised up to compete. Great. Let me turn to Kelly now. Um, one of the things you saw in Bruce's presentation and in the paper, and even reinforced by um, Greg's use of the word language, is that global fluency is a play on that term or the concept of being fluent in a language. And yet there are, when we look at, you know, that most American cities actually fall in a continuum of the extent to which they think and act globally. And at one level, you can be globally aware. You know that the, something exists outside your borders, but you're mostly domestic oriented. That you are globally oriented, you start to rank your city in a global, uh, against global cities. You might start to do trade missions. There's some you know, work in that regard. But the third is to be fully globally fluent, to, be, to everything you do is put through that global lens. Where do you put Denver on those, on, on those three? Where do you, where's Denver right now in those three stages? Yeah. Uh, Mayor Daly said just stay at the top. <laughs> <laughs> There, I think we're probably in the orientation like most cities in the country, but I, I think one of the interesting challenges that we know is very real. Uh, as you, it's not just about a few of us in leadership roles saying we need to be globally fluent and this is important. You have to change the mind of your community about your capacity to do that. And I think in the last few years, we've had a number of opportunities that are changing Colorado's mind 
about our ability as a region to compete on a global stage. And they're funny things. They weren't things that I think even all of us predicted. Uh, our investment in a transit system that was a massive investment and now we're delivering on it, delivering on it because of public-private cooperation, frankly, not because uh, we got the investment right on the front end. And I think we're even surprising ourselves a little bit. DIA is a great example of one of those things that has changed our mind about our ability to compete. And here's a funny one that maybe it's because my own role in this, but when we brought the Democratic National Convention here, it changed our view about who we were competing with in the United States. It put us in a top tier city. We delivered a fantastic convention and we left with this sense of the world is our limit and we're changing kind of where we'll play. And I think that's key as we go from orientation to advance toward fluency. That's great. And so the mayor just laid out his priorities. What's the chamber's priorities? What are, how, what are you doing with your partners to ensure that Denver continues to move down that path towards fluency? Yeah, well, uh, it's, you know, actually, we work very closely with our uh, public uh, partners yeah. in doing this work. Uh, we've identified clusters. We work inside those industry clusters to try to bring companies and ensure we have a workforce that can feed those companies. We've had tremendous success on clean tech. Uh, Northern Europe uh, knows who we are very well. Um, we don't have to describe anymore. We're by the Rocky Mountains. Um, they now know where Denver is. Those flights matter. You know, it's the chicken and egg question. Yes. And I think Tokyo says, again, both to us and to the world, we can and will sustain flights. And we have to do it a little differently than everyone else, right? Um, a, a big city gets to go to 10 Fortune 500 companies and say, let's commit to what we can deliver in terms of flying this flight. Uh, we go to thousands of small companies and say, let's commit to what we can deliver. And I think that work is making us stronger and more sustainable in the long run because we really are coming together as a community to do that work. Mm. Let me um, come back, make tease out this point a little bit more. And I'm gonna direct this to Mayor Hancock, especially since you've got a number of your um, municipal colleagues and others here in the room. Um, Denver is known for its regional collaboration. And it is not just about a civic, it's about the public. It's what you were saying about the awareness and education among the electorate. I think this is increasingly important because this is a region that goes to the voter a lot to make transformative investments and as, as uh, mentioned by the transit. And in fact, the Denver's ability to do that with its electorate was featured in our book on the Metropolitan Revolution. Right. Um, but one of the most important aspects or traits of global fluency, coming back to this first one, leadership with a worldview, is that it has to extend beyond the mayor being very articulate, Tom and Kelly being very articulate, that it has, it's about a network of leaders that understand it. Do you think that this global stage, global competition, global opportunities, how, how has that, how deep has that spread to all parts of Denver? Because that's what you need to succeed here. Sure, I think, I think first we need to recognize this is a journey, it, mm -hmm. it's not a sprint. And yeah. as I come in as a new mayor of Denver articulating and thinking about globalization, I recognize that it has to be a process where all of us kind of educate and grow up together with this new thought, this new value, and new practice. Um, we're fortunate that we have the, the likes of Tom Clark in the region um, who continue to press upon us the importance to think globally, think about our competitive edge, that we have an airport that it won't survive if we're not globally competitive. An airport that's, that not only employs Denver folks, quite frankly, it employs more folks who live outside of Denver than live in the city, 70% of the employees of the 30,000 employees directly or indirectly employed by the airport are outside of the boundaries of the city of Denver. And so it's easy to express the importance of globalization and global competitiveness um, uh, with those uh, employees, but also to the businesses. Kelly talks about the business community. Obviously they get it, they get it before we get it as public sector. We're focused like this oftentimes. But if we open up our worldview, they recognize that they have a greater market in which to market their goods, move their products, as well as to create economic opportunity for themselves as a business. And so doing the partnership, not just within Denver, but regionally, um, is a real opportunity. And then finally, we can't just go promote Denver, right? We have to, we're, when I'm in Tokyo, Japan, I'm promoting the region. I can't talk about mountains because the city of Denver doesn't have mountains. <laughs> we can see them from here. Um, but, but I want to talk about the importance of getting out and being in Vail and being in Aspen and being in Dillon and, and Breckenridge and all the great places 
of, of Colorado. And so the, I'm a great spokesman for that. But it's, they're beyond the boundaries of the city and county of Denver. We must think regionally in terms of the attraction. Um, and, and to be able to compete on that level, I don't care if you're in Longmont or Broomfield as a company. The reality is that the city of Pe the people who live in the city of Denver will have an opportunity to go and work there. And those folks who work there who may live somewhere else will come into the city of Denver to shop and play as well. Great. I see Greg really wanting to jump into this, and I will, I will bring you in. But let me ask... <laughs> um, well, let me ask Kelly one more question before I turn to Greg, which is, um, let's talk about this cluster analysis you did. One of the traits listed here, number three, and what Greg said was really important, is to have industry specializ specializations that have global reach. So what are those unique industries that Denver specializes in that really stand out as world class? So this region really has had tremendous success. First, I, w I have to say one thing, because I saw on the slides uh, that ag was not listed as one of our top exports, and I just got to give a shout out to uh, beef uh, exports really are. Um, it's not what we focus on in the clusters, and I'll, I'll talk a little about the clusters, but it's so important, and it's something we're very proud of in Colorado. And I know I've got a couple ag people here, so I don't <laughs> want them to forget. I know you're here. Um, in some of the places we've had tremendous success. The, our aerospace industry is very good. Aviation is another place you're going to see a lot of our exports. We've also had uh, clean tech. We continue to be a very strong economy in that. Uh, and telecom, as you all know, it, we're one of the top uh, in the country in IT uh, as well. But I think the one I want to highlight a little is an interesting strategy around bioscience. Uh, right, these are, these are clusters that everybody in the country knows. These are places that you can uniquely position yourself. We're very service oriented and because of our location, we're not shipping big stuff, right? We gotta ship the smaller and the more kind of specialized things. And in bioscience, one thing that happened, this is a great example of public and private coming together to grow an industry cluster in Colorado. But Fitzsimmons, which was a base that was transitioning, you get a public investment, and now the private investment that's coming there, we have over 600 bioscience companies. I think this is another one of those places you'll continue to see our opportunity really grow internationally in terms of our exports and our connections in the world. I'm curious, why did you not mention travel and tourism? As I no, think that's uh, so a huge... Sorry, no question, uh, ag and travel and tourism are very, very important in our clusters. We don't focus on those, so I didn't mention it, but if there's a tourist, pr yes, we love tourism. Very important, a huge <laughs> part of our economy. <laughs> so that's, that, that's the specializations piece. I wanna come back to the issue about global reach, and I think you and I talked a little bit about this previously. Um, this region exports about $10 billion worth of goods and services, but only 7.2% of this region's economy actually is, grows from global demand. It makes it one of the smallest shares of export intensity in the country. So tell us, you know, what do we need to do to make this region not just civically globally aware, but the economically, that your economy is really globally integrated. What more can we do to boost exports and FDI? Yeah. Uh, so this is where I think it's the slow, hard work of when you have a lot of small business. Uh, it means you have to touch a lot more people to help them find their path to the rest of the world. And I think it's going to take us a little longer, but I think when we get there, we'll be a much stronger powerhouse and frankly, more sustainable because we'll have such a broad base of people engaging in it. So we're a little slow coming, but I would say, hold on, give us about a decade. And I think, <laughs> uh, and uh, the recession for us was an extremely positive part of changing people's mind about if you want to grow your company, we only have one place we can take you now, and it's going to be outside of here. Yeah. And, and I think that's helped the conversation. It's interesting, I was just thinking about how, you know, the, I think the national average on export intensity is 11%. 11 or 13% of the U.S. economy is dependent on exports, and that on a global stage is really small compared to our competitors yeah. in Germany and Asia. So 7% is even smaller than that. And I keep thinking about how the president has laid out a goal of doubling exports in five years. It may be more interesting for this region to aspire to uh, not necessarily doubling, but increasing the share of the economy mm -hmm. that is export-oriented. Um, well, so I anyway, think, if I can yeah. add, Amy, I think Bruce pointed out one of the pre precursors, of course, to doing that is manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that uh, Paul Washington, the economic Devel development director for the city and county of Denver, is focused on is precision manufacturing. 
we must grow the workforce, the, the capacity yeah. of that workforce, but also attract manufacturers into, into our region. So that, that's something we have to focus on. That's a, that's, that's a great comment. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that in part is part of the reason why, mm -hmm. um, you know, the stronger orientation are the places that are more production uh, houses, but, um, but services, as Bruce said, is a fast growing part of the global economy. So there's a lot right. of service opportunities uh, to be done on the global stage. Okay, let me talk to, um, let me turn to Greg now. And I, you know, one of the things that our, our Kelly and our team talked a little bit about in preparing for this panel is that, you know, Denver is coming back, coming from a little bit of a disadvantage because of its a location. It's, you know, so it's, it's an inland location. It is a state capital, however. Um, it has, um, therefore, it's created an inland port to ensure that it has that global reach. Um, it has mostly small, mid-sized companies, not multinationals. So when you think about what cities around the globe sort of uh, have sort of the same characteristics as, De as Denver, and what are there any models or lessons from those cities that can inform what this city needs to do to be more um, globally fluent? If we had three hours, that would be a great <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> Uh, Amy, I mean, just taking the 42 metros that we looked at for the Global Fluency Report with my colleagues uh, Brad and Joe, jo Joe is here uh, with us today, uh, you could say that, of course, all metros are different and everyone is distinctive and unique, but to my mind that there is a group that begins to emerge in there that's quite important, and I, I think of them as the competitive middleweight cities. They're not big, like a New York or a Chicago. They're nimble, which is one of their advantages. They have this interesting combination of wonderful natural and environmental assets, coupled with a sort of medium density of urbanization and nice cities within them. They've got good R&D and universities. They've got um, the ability to commercialize that knowledge into a, a cadre of, of small businesses. And they've got a desire to create a kind of quality of life offer that suits people at almost every stage of their life cycle. You don't have to go somewhere else to get on. And um, amongst that group of competitive middleweight cities, I would put Brisbane in Australia. That was one of our uh, case studies. I'd put Oslo in Norway. Um, I'd put Cape Town in South Africa. I'd probably also put Barcelona in Spain. So these are four of the other 42 alongside Denver. Now, interestingly, I think they can learn a lot from Denver to start with. Uh, you know, this superb regionalism that is here, this clear, authoritative, confident leadership, um, this desire to really create what I would call an economic development ecosystem is terrific. Um, but they also have done some things very well. You know, Barcelona has really nailed it on a compelling global identity. One of the problems that the middleweight metros face is that it's hard to become visible in a world where there are other much bigger metros around you. Um, another thing that I think Brisbane has done superbly is this international connectivity where they have this Australia Gold Coast initiative which is essentially a regional logistics platform. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, Oslo of course has done wonderfully in developing this sense of having a, a culture of knowledge and innovation. But you know, there are common challenges that these competitive middleweights face. They have to watch out for not becoming dominated by one sector or one market. It's very easy, particularly where there's commodities around. <laughs> you mustn't become dominated. The second thing is they have to achieve scale, and that's difficult when you're not big, so the regionalism piece is key. Uh, they have to create visibility, and that's hard. So there's a kind of recipe for these competitive middleweights in how to get to the point where you're fighting for the world championship. And there's a particular set of constraints you have to overcome, as well as having all of these natural assets and opportunities attached to them. That's great. And by the way, we're going to uh, turn over to Q&A in about five minutes. And I'm sure many of you probably have questions even directed at Greg, uh, who's got such great anecdotes. Let me just ask you one other follow-up question, which is going to be a question you're naturally going to get, Joe, you're going to get, Brad's going to get, who are co authors of this paper, which is, is there any city that embodies all 10 of these traits? Well, there are some places like the Londons and the New Yorks who have been engaged in the process of globalization for so long 
that they have internalized and digested all of this. Mm -hmm. But for those places, there's a different set of challenges, which is how do you manage the unintended consequences of global engagement, which is about two-tier labor markets, it's about inflation in your housing markets, it's about overuse of your infrastructure, it's about congestion, rising prices, it's about tension. So I would say for those metros that have become globally fluent over centuries, mm -hmm. the problem becomes how you deal with the consequences of successful globalization. That's slightly different from your competitive middleweights, where it's about how do you start winning your first world championships. Great. Mayor Daly, we spent a lot of time talking about positive lessons. I want you to, as the mayor, offer observations about mistakes. And I know that, for instance, you, you, have, a lot of, you have a lot of stories about what the federal government hasn't done. <laughs> but let's talk about well, cities. What, what, are, what mistakes can cities make that could set them back on this path towards global fluency? Well, I think they'll get afraid of uh, the rest of the world through the use of national security out of Washington. Uh, everyone that comes to investments around the world, as mayors and governors travel the world for investments, the federal government is stepping up and they're questioning whether or not they should invest in these metro areas. And to me, uh, that would do great harm uh, to metro areas. We've always had foreign investments uh, into cities and we should welcome them. Uh, but the national security is overcoming all these issues. And so we have a lot in common. You know, the mid-sized companies in, in the Midwest can't export because the 80 programs of the federal government. And there's a lot of commonality between us and Denver. You know, we're in the middle parts of the country. We're basically landlocked in the sense that we have the Great Lakes. Uh, but to me, uh, you, you respect the past. Uh, Denver's always been a, uh, a global city, agriculture, mining, mm -hmm. and energy. But you can't say energy is going to be the answer to the future of Denver. There's more to it, as Kelly pointed out, with the small businesses. Uh, mistakes have been made, but you can't become dependent off the federal government. I think that is the public-private partnership been successful in, in Chicago and Denver. That is the key. We need private money for infrastructure. We need private money uh, to be used from our pension funds in regards to infrastructure of a, of a state in the federal government. If it, that doesn't happen, then we're caught back. It's up to the governors and mayors. You can't print the money. The federal government prints money. And from my viewpoint, uh, mistakes have been made, but we can learn from these mistakes. And Denver is on the right track. Let's be realistic. We have strong leadership, the public, the not-for-profit, and government all working together. Your governor, your mayor, all these uh, metropolitan mayors are working. And to me, be confident where you're going. America lost his confidence. Mm -hmm. Mayors and governors are very confident about the future. And to me, that is the greatest mistake that America has made. They lost their confidence for the world. The mayors and governors are looking at the world as an asset in the future growth. So I take away from this conversation that, and also our historic familiarity with the Denver area um, and admiration for this region is that you are definitely poised, but you're also on a journey, as you said. Maybe the path to go from orientation to internalizing the global realities uh, in everything you do. So both Kelly and the mayor, tell us what's next? What else, what are the un, uh, untapped areas uh, for this region to pursue to get to that level of internalization? Uh, well, there's no question flights will continue to be our focus. South America, we got them in our sights now, and I think um, there's a lot of energy around the Middle East as well, and there's some hope about potential there. I, I think what we're all hoping is, you know, the kind of dedication that it took to deliver that Tokyo flight of 15 years that none of us have to uh, devote that kind of time, that we're right. reaching that point where we can tip it. At the same time, maintain the domestic service we have in the country. Uh, both are very important, we think, for us to be a global city, and I think we're gonna, you'll see us work very hard to try to keep both of those, grow international while we maintain our domestic. I think that's a key point. I, you know, the most attractive thing to the um, airlines regarding the nonstop flight to Tokyo as well as Reykjavik and Mexico City was our domestic connectivity. And so our airport remaining competitive uh, domestically is critically important. And the next step, if you will, I don't think it's a next step, it's a continuum 
our continuation of what we've been focused on is the education component. Um, to be very dogged and suffocated by desire to really make sure that we have a competitive education system that is preparing our young people to compete. I'm going to let um, both Greg and the mayor, the mayor, close. Maybe offer some final observations about other pieces of advice that we haven't really covered here for the Denver region. I'm looking at these 10 traits, and I think we covered most of these topics in these conversations. Maybe we haven't spent enough on opportunity appeal to the world. This goes back to the immigration, that we need to be open to all kinds of incomers into the region, um, education and innovation. Um, any other observations about these other traits that you want to offer before we open up to the audience? Well, I think uh, Denver has been in a great position, and, and, and they have a leadership. But most importantly, uh, not just South America and Mexico. They cannot just attach them to Mexico. There's more to Denver than that. It's all throughout China, Southeast Asia, through Africa, uh, and the rest of the world and Europe. They, they have to really look at the whole world, and everybody kind of pigeon points, oh, well, you're going to just be Mexico. No, I think you're going to look beyond that. And Kelly and the mayor has talked about that, looking beyond and Tom and others to the world. I mean, this is positioned uh, in, in a way that uh, they're going to welcome the world here, and they're going to go to the world. And see, I think that's the, the passion I think you have uh, in Denver through the business and the political as well as the non for profit. That's great. Amy, it's difficult to offer advice because what's happening here is extremely impressive. And I will now go on my journeys around the world talking about what Denver is doing. So that's a, a good thing. <laughs> that's going to help us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but I would say that, that similar cities to Denver are, or similar regions to Denver are focusing a lot on this uh, opportunity and appeal to the world. Yeah. International students mm -hmm. is becoming one of the most competitive global markets. The ability to internationalize your talent pool through your universities is key. Uh, number eight, investment for strategic priorities. All of the other regions that are, have a similar character to Denver are working really hard on attracting those sovereign wealth funds, those institutional investors, the private equity piece. Um, number nine, you know, government as a, glo as a, as a global enabler. Um, I mean, the mayor knows much more about this than I do, but all of those metros are gradually getting their national, their federal, their state governments on side with yeah. the global story and aligning those programs so you have an intergovernmental agenda. And then on the global identity, I mean, I've, I've been desperate to come to Denver for 20 years because I had an idea about Denver that was to do with the Rocky Mountains and it was to do with music and it was to do with livability and cuisine and a certain quality of life. Um, I'm a well-traveled man, and I don't yet see very clearly yep. um, the other aspects of the Denver identity, mm -hmm. the knowledge-rich, the tech-savvy, the yeah. entrepreneurial, the innovative. Yeah. I suspect that you've got to turn up the volume even more mm -hmm. than you're already doing because, yeah. you know, Denver's in business with things that the world really wants to buy, yeah. and they need to know the shop's open. Well done. Okay, it is now your turn. Are there any folks who have questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh -oh. First of all, I want to thank the panel for some wonderful. I want to thank the panel. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I want to thank the panel for uh, coming to Denver and discussing this topic with us. Um, I'm Sue Ann Brondine of the Business School at the University of Colorado, Denver. And I want to thank Greg in particular for mentioning universities yes. because I think. The universities are definitely part of the mix. If you look at it, uh, we have great universities here, but at the University of Colorado Denver, 10, per, 10 to 15 percent of our students are international students. The question I have is, you know, where those students are coming from, primarily Asia and the Middle East right now. I think we have a wonderful opportunity to align, uh, to use your term, or coordinate, to say where are the areas of the world that we want to concentrate on because we have lots of faculty connections, lots of student connections, and lots of ways of coordinating some of those kinds of things. So I'd love to hear from any of the panelists on their comments about what universities ought to be doing. Thank you. I, I will just share that along with us on the delegation to Asia this last trip, there was a good delegation or cadre of uh, higher education uh, professionals. 
Um, and, and that was critically important because we have to grow. If we're going to grow our appeal globally, we have to grow um, our number of uh, international students that are coming to the United States, to Denver and Colorado in particular, to study. So that's clearly, critically important that we focus on that area. I was talking last night at dinner with uh, Chancellor Elliman, who, was, who had just returned from Beijing. And you're uh, Shanghai? Was Shanghai? Oh, Beijing. It was, yeah, he was jet lagged, just as I am. Um, and we talked about the, the importance of continuing to drive our presence and promote the opportunities in Colorado to those international students all over the world. And so not, as equally excited as I was to take those nine students, I was just as excited to take the higher education professionals mm -hmm. because we've got to get dedicated to that global engagement. Uh, I'd like to point out that Risa was in uh, China two years ago. And I looked out in the audience giving a speech uh, on behalf uh, of the Catton Law Firm. And there was a principal of a Catholic high school in Chicago, Christian Brothers, which I went to De La Salle, St. Pat's High School. And I went down and asked him, did you come all the way to uh, uh, Beijing or Shanghai to hear the former mayor? He said, no, I've been here for three weeks. A Catholic high school in Chicago recruits high school students who graduated from eighth grade into the city of Chicago. And so we may talk about higher ed, <laughs> you better start thinking about the high school system. Because it, it, it Culver Merrill Military Academy outside Chicago has a high percentage of uh, South Americans. And so when we talk about universities, we have great opportunity to look at uh, uh, K through 12. We don't realize the asset that we have. We know we have difficulties, uh, but from my viewpoint, uh, with all the difficulties, uh, we include everyone. We give everyone that opportunity of education, which is very rare in the world. We give it to them here. Whether we have problems in the long run, that is our future dealing with uh, high school as well as universities. Awesome. Um, there are three things that universities typically do in successful metros like this around the world. One, all the universities work together on a common marketing strategy. Instead of separate marketing strategies, I don't know how many mm. universities there are in the region, but I'm sure it's more than one. And uh, I'm sure that there's a need um, to really synchronize that. The second thing is, just as the mayor was saying, you have to align the higher education recruitment with the, the trade markets you're trying to get into. But the third thing is a much softer thing. You have to give international students, when they're here in the region, such a wonderful experience of being a temporary citizen of this region that the Denver tag on their resume <laughs> becomes the thing that they feel most proud about that they take into mm. the rest of their lives, that they feel an affinity, they feel they've been welcomed, and they feel that this is a region they want to do business with in the future, whether they become a prime minister or whether they become a, a head of a company or whether they become a research scientist. You want them to yearn to return. And I think that's, good. that's a very important thing about the experience they have, how they're welcomed, how they're nurtured, how you get them to work for the region during vacation times, things like that, animate the experience. It's so funny because you just reminded me of the conversations we've had about the power and the strategy of a visitor economy. Yeah. And that visitors, including international students, and how many of those visitors, if they have that great memory, they come back as foreign investors uh, to come back and set up companies, yep. uh, to set up partnerships. And so those do, those do can, can come back as economic relationships. Uh, other questions? Let's take these two. Yep. Thank you, and uh, thank you to J.P. Morgan Chase and Brookings for coming. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation this morning. Dave Tavia, I work in the construction industry. One of the things that you describe when the presentation was the three different stages of global fluency. Mm -hmm. uh, where do most U.S. cities fall in that scale? European cities, and you know, maybe describe for us the nirvana, the what is true uh, financial and global fluency. What does that look like? Let me. Can we pick up the second question so we can address both? Yep, right here, the mayor, the mayor. Yep. Thank you very much. Again, thanks to the panel. I think it's uh, terrific that we have this opportunity to have the Global Cities Initiative here in Denver on its uh, four-stop uh, tour. Uh, my name is Doug Tisdale. I'm the mayor of Cherry Hills Village here in uh, the Colorado region. 
Uh, we are a suburb of Denver and happy to be so because this region along with Centennial and the other cities benefit by virtue of that. And that leads me to point number nine, government as global enabler. Uh, obviously, the federal government is responsible for the laws and uh, uh, treaties that uh, address our relations for trade purposes and otherwise. I know there are many things that municipal government can do to enable these greater global relations. I'd like to ask the mayors, what are some of the specific examples that you have of activities that government can take to be a global enabler? What, you want to? We can take that one first, and then come back to the okay. global uh, in stages. In a sense, that uh, uh, attachment dealing with uh, your sister city program more than just a sister city economically. You bring your business community. Uh, uh, adopting uh, airport around the world, you have sister uh, airport relationships. Then you take your universities and you adapt all around the world. You go so, uh, through South America. You go through all through Asia. And you stop, uh, start adapting universities as well as airports, and then from your business community your small, medium-sized business, basically promoting them, uh, dealing with new technology, the creative class. And besides that, uh, the natural resources you have here. And so what you have to do is you have to think throughout the metropolitan area and bring the mayors and other people through the metropolitan area. It just can't be like Chicago or Denver. That's over with. You're not really competing. We're not really competing. Denver's not going to be competing against Chicago or Houston you're going to be competing with the world. And that's what the Global Initiative uh, really starts rethinking this, how we can all work together. And working together is very important because I think cities in America have to come together as a force, a political force in Washington for change. The government, the governor had to change. Cities have to change every day, balance your budget, make difficult decisions. We have to get the federal government working with us on behalf of the journey throughout the world. And I think there's examples uh, that we have adopted in Chicago with our universities, uh, with our uh, high schools, uh, the language program. Uh, the council generals are very important, uh, in bringing council generals and ambassadors in Washington to your city. You really promote that, and you have, and they want to come here. I bet they've been here many a times, but an official way you do it through the metro metropolitan area is the key. Kelly and the mayor, do you, do you have a federal agenda given everything you've identified has a federal implication, whether it's on federal infrastructure policy, trade treaties, immigration policy. Right. Do you have one or, per the mayor's question, one or two priorities about how we can get the federal government to be an enabler to your success? Yeah, you know, I, I've spent some time in Washington, uh, as I know Kelly has, in meeting with the U.S. Uh, trade, International Trade Office and, and, and really working with them to make sure that what we're trying to do is aligned with their federal or their international mission as well. And that we also kind of cultivate those relationships so they can help us out as well. But I'll tell you, outside of Washington, you ask what's the most important role I can play as mayor. I know three things that are universal no matter where I go in the world. The concept of love, music, and relationships. And as mayor, I really believe my number one responsibility universally for this region is to build those relationships. And going back and forth to Japan seven, eight times, it wasn't because I like being on long flights or I was <laughs> gonna go find the world's best sushi. It was, because, it was because we recognize the importance of cultivating and nurturing those relationships in order to get to the ultimate destination. Yes, we have a federal agenda, um, but, but uh, this is where I won't be as nice as Bruce and, and um, be really polite. I think part of it for us has been an acceptance that our problems will not be solved there. Yeah. And our financial problems will come to roost more here in Colorado than yep. they ever have in our history. Yep. And we're gonna have to control our destiny and set our course ourselves and figure out how we uh, get there. That said, I will highlight the immigration bill that is there right now, we have weighed in on. And I think it's relevant to some of the discussion you just heard from Sue Ann on, uh, for example, international students. One of the great challenges we face here are those H-1B visas. These are highly technical trained students. We send them home to compete against us. We do send them home, I think, with great loyalty. I traveled yeah. in the Middle East, and I will tell you, those Colorado Minds and CU students were running to meet the Colorado girl. <laughs> I, I felt very prideful of how much they loved us, but we're not keeping them here. And I think we have a real opportunity to keep more of those kids here and to make sure we drive our economy and those world connections. Great point, great point. 
Greg, on, on um, So the mayor's question, I mean, Bruce actually, I think, articulated this very well. I consider myself a, a friend, a great fan of America. America's great success in the 20th century was to become the world's dominant economy. The unintended consequence of that was that American metros went domestic. And Bruce put that extremely well. He's right. So um, America is at the same time the most diverse country in the world and one of the most insular. So the majority of US metros are not globally oriented or globally fluent, and they're just at the beginning of becoming globally aware. Denver <laughs> is a leader in achieving global orientation, and one or two historic centers like the New Yorks and the Chicagos and the Los Angeles have a measure of global fluency. The same is more or less true in Europe. Europe has no advantage over America here. The only thing I would say is that the pattern of European integration and the maintenance of 31 countries with different languages has meant that European integration has been a kind of practice ground for globalization for European metros. Um, what does great look like? Well, I talked about London and New York. What about Singapore and Hamburg? Mm. These are two places that have achieved, you know, Singapore from nowhere has become, you know, the the, the, super, the superstar poster child of, of the global city. Mm -hmm. Hamburg, from very unpromising position 50 years ago, has re-established itself as, as Europe's great trade center. Um, and I think that there are other places that will surprise you. When you read the case study of Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. you will be very surprised at how incredibly globally fluent Tel Aviv is becoming. What's the lesson of this? It's not about size. It's all about your willingness to pursue the 10 traits, and I'm absolutely certain that Denver is headed in the right direction. Great, and uh, Greg, just remind us, uh, you have the copy of the paper in your packets, but if you go online, you will also be able to access the 40-some plus case studies of both U US and international cities and their path to getting to global fluency. Um, I will just want to say that uh, part of the mission of the Global Cities Initiative is to spark this discussion in your community about where you are on this continuum, and I hope we have done that. And I know uh, Brookings and J.B. Morgan Chase are committed to help Denver and if its many regional partners to move, join you in this journey. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please uh, join me in welcoming, uh, thanking our panels. And, um, Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.